My talk is a bit more quantitative maybe than the, the talks before and um, unfortunately you can't see it's also a collaborative work with um, three political scientists from Hong Kong, the US and uh, Germany so it's a very um, international project. So what we are studying uh, is political astroturfing on Twitter which maybe not the term but the phenomenon is at least since the US election like in, in everybody's head. Um, so before we come to the to the topic I want to just show this I, I find it very interesting that in the Journal of Democracy in 2010 there was an, an article about the internet and social media as it, it being um, a liberation technology because it allows people to um, get into discord, into, into political discord, into organizing themselves uh, as a few examples are uh, the, the Arab Spring movements, the Indignados movements or the Occupy Wall Street where people um, uh, they, they, they organize themselves on social media to start uh, grassroots movements so from, from small uh, movements in particular areas to a large uh, movement in, 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 a, in a country. Uh, and then just so July 2016, six years later in the same or seven years later in the same journal on democracy it's suddenly the question is can democracy survive the internet and this was targeted about of course what happened at the US election with the interference of or the alleged interference of the uh, Russians in the election. Um, of course if you have this phenomenon uh, you can um, like these movements on social media can change things on a national level. Why not use this to create anticipated or fake grassroots movements? Uh, this is where the term political astroturfing comes from, astroturf being a brand of uh, fake grass. Um, it's, it's been defined in several ways, but I like this one. It's uh, like a form of secretive um, propaganda that tries to mimic these genuine grassroots movements. Um, or opinions but with the goal uh, to, to follow an agenda of a hidden organization and mostly it's uh, influence public opinions on, <coughs> on uh, political issues. How do they implement these, these, um, these campaigns? How do they uh, try to convince people? Um, what has been studied quite a lot in, in, on, on social media and specifically on Twitter is uh, bots and uh, so-called cyborgs. Cyborgs are semi-automated accounts. Um, is, uh, you can flood social media platforms um, quite easily with thousands of bots that, that uh, like try to, to, to send out a message and it seems like a lot of people are behind this. Problem is, uh, first of all, it's low cost for the people that, that, that do this. Uh, they, they, there's low effort involved. But also the success rate of convincing people with only bots might be quite low because people might recognize this as being like some form of s spam um, on the, the social media platform. Of course, over the, over the years, uh, these bots get more and more sophisticated, uh, but we also have more and more sophisticated machine learning detection algorithms uh, to, to uh, detect these bot activity on Twitter. Uh, the most um, famous one may, might be the web, uh, the web page bot or not and what they do is they use more than a thousand uh, features from Twitter accounts in order to classify if an account is um, uh, a bot a bot or not uh, this includes user meter uh, metadata just like the, the time offset of tweets uh, because it's assumed that bots just tweet at given intervals uh, the sentiment of tweets, uh, but it's very user-centric. So for instance, um, okay, one cannot see it now, but this is my Twitter account. For me, it's a 50-50 chance that I'm a bot or a real person. So this already shows that they are very effective, but might not get everything. And it's also not so clear. Um, it, it doesn't give us an explanation of how these um, uh, the, the, the mechanisms behind these campaigns. Uh, the, this whole research, while it's being, has produced a lot of very nice algorithms, it's very uh, computational driven and very little um, social science theory has gone into it and so far the human component in these campaigns has been uh, mostly neglected. So it's not only bots or semi-automated accounts, it's actual 
real people that sit there working um, or tweeting or posting for some sort of political campaign online. Like the, uh, as it's always in the media, the, the internet research uh, agency in, the, in, the in the Russia. So we have been starting our work uh, a bit more from, from a theoretic perspective to, to try to think about how are these 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 uh, campaigns organized um, and and what can we derive from this for their, their action on the social media platforms so it, this is a very simple diagram how these um, these these uh, campaigns can be organized we have some form of instigator a principal who organizes these campaigns could be uh, political stakeholders uh, companies, whoever is, has, has an interest in, 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 in shaping opinions. Then they need, of course, a second layer of agents who carry out their work. That these, the instigators cannot post themselves um, or cannot be active on social media themselves most of the time, so they recruit people for that. Uh, these are the incentivized users who are supposed to pose as regular users on social media for them. Uh, and these agents then again they might be in charge of uh, bot armies, smaller bot armies, but also have uh, several real accounts they are, they, they are using and trying to act uh, on acting human on the, on the platform. So of course this like principal agent uh, model leads to some principal agent problems. Uh, the principals of course want, okay, the agents should produce as many genuine sounding messages as possible to convince people from their agenda. Then we have the agents who might um, be only in for the money. So they are not really, all of them are not really uh, intrinsically motivated to say, okay, this is a good thing what we are doing. Um, I, I'm completely behind this, this, this idea. So I'm, I am trying my best to produce genuine sounding uh, messages. So they, they might resolve into like sh cutting edges somehow and being just doing the bare minimum. Uh, so the consequences are, um, so this is a list of some, some of the con consequences that might uh, occur is uh, agents cut corners by copy pasting. So they might have several accounts, but they say just copy paste their message in all their accounts and send it out at the same time. Uh, they might just do retweeting because this, this is low effort. I just have to click and say, what, this is nice. Um, they might not want to produce um, original content, but refer to news paper articles that, that convey these points. Um, they only work when supervised. So we might observe that they are actually only active during uh, office hours and they don't want to engage in in genuine discussions because that requires a bit more, more work. Um, on the following slides, I'm gonna focusing on the, the, the office hours only and the um, cutting corners by copy pasting. What we have been investigating is um, that it's uh, the presidential election in South Korea in 2012. So this is already kind of Twitter archeology span because it's like six year old data. Um, but it is really a, a very nice case for it, and it's, uh, we think it's one of the first cases where this, this actually occurred. Now what happened, there was a presidential election, the candidates were Park and Moon, and Park won at the end, and the NIS, that's the Secret Service, launched one of these astroturfing campaigns in favor of Park. So just, this is the same as, I don't know, the MI6 tweeting for Theresa May, for example. Um, this campaign was discovered by some, some journalists and the headquarter was raided just a week before the, uh, before the election. And there was really like, a, like in movies, the, the police stormed their, their headquarters and agents tried to burn evidence and hit for, uh, for 40 hours in their offices and tried to get rid of as much evidence as possible. Um, but uh, they couldn't get rid of all the evidence. And so there was a, is a long ongoing court case since 2015 and there's still uh, some things that are being uh, resolved. So from these official court documents, we got a list of 1,008 accounts that were used by the um, NIS in, in, this, in, this, um, in this campaign, which puts us in a very uh, 
nice position because we actually have a sort of a ground truth data set. So we know the agents, we don't have to detect them. Um, we are sure these are the accounts uh, that were part of this campaign. Then we have a data set of 90 million tweets that were posted in um, Korean in the time June 2012 to December 2012. Now this is just a short summary of, of the tweeting frequencies. In red you see the NIS accounts and they were mostly active between September and uh, November and you see here uh, this is uh, December 11th so when the um, headquarters got raided they basically stopped being active. For the regular users you see you know, this is the, sp the biggest spike occurs on election day of course. So I said um, the, uh, we are going to look at two consequences from the principal agent problem. One is uh, the daily and hourly activity patterns and this was really a really striking result. Uh, you see again here the activity over the day from regular users here in black. They are getting more and more active in the evening uh, and the NIS accounts really their, their main activity is uh, between 8 and 5 in the, in the evening. Uh, and it was, so in, in a court document it said, so they had m m meetings in the morning around 8 o'clock and then they were supposed to go out into um, internet cafes to hide their IP address and then do their, do their work from there. And the same is for, for um, if you look at the week, uh, they're mostly active Monday to Friday and on Saturday and Sunday there's a large drop in, in activity. And the activity we see actually on the weekend or during the night is all uh, bot, bot accounts that just tweet um, newspaper articles from conservative newspaper um, newspapers. The more fascinating result for us is this coordinated tweeting. So I said the copy pasting uh, of tweets. We were prepared for, okay, they cannot be that, I don't want to say stupid, but so naive to, to, to really just do the copy pasting and say, okay, we have to do some some text mining and see how, uh, how similar the tweets are, but they really literally copy pasted a lot. So um, this network shows you know, that the, the nodes are um, accounts and an edge between them indicates that they tweeted exactly the same tweet within one and a half minutes. And the thicker the line, uh, the more instances we observe of this, uh, what we call co-tweeting. Um, between these accounts. The color of the account is also something we got from the court documents. It's, um, it um, shows the actual agent, so the human who was behind this account. And you can see quite clearly uh, this is one agent uh, that whose accounts, so you can distinguish the agents according to the code reading, uh, all the components, they form cohesive clusters in, in the network. We also have instances of accounts like uh, this white one here where it was unclear which agent was in charge but with this we can cl quite clearly say okay it must have been this brown agent who was in, in, in charge of this account. Um, we, can, we could also turn this into a detection method so we didn't use any kind, sort of machine learning we just looked at so okay now we looked only at the NIS accounts let's look at the whole data set and do this code reading network. So this is the complete uh, co-tweeting network of all users um, in, in Korea and the red nodes you see are the NIS accounts and gray uh, users are potentially regular accounts. So again you see a lot of these cohesive clusters and we looked at all of them individually and there are a lot of of course spam accounts, spam bots that post the same question all the time but the most interesting a component is this one, which is the, the largest connected in the network, where there are a lot of these, these red accounts, but also a lot of um, potentially re um, regular accounts, which we found uh, then to be okay uh, as, as um, very much resembling the activity of, of the NIS accounts. So this gave us another thousand accounts that are much like, uh, which are very likely to be part of this campaign. And just as a, um, um, one, one of the indicators we had is again the hourly activity. Uh, in red we have the known NIS accounts, in black the regular users, and um, in the 
other colors from different co-activity patterns in, in the data, the um, suspects. The only difference we observe here, again, we have uh, most activity in office hours, is that in all three groups that we additionally um, detect is this dip at 12 o'clock. So this, this seems to be the accounts that get l a lunch break. <coughs> um, and again, the same for the weekend, uh, mostly during, during uh, Monday, Friday, and the activity drops on, on the weekend. Now, as I said, okay, this is all like uh, uh, Twitter archaeology, and we have this new case from 2016. Um, how did the, the IRA campaign work? Does our theory about this whole principal agent um, construct hold there too? Um, so just about, I think, a week ago or two weeks ago, Twitter released a big data set on um, accounts or on the posts allegedly done by the IRA. And we did exactly the same as for the, for the uh, Korean data. We looked at uh, copy-pasting patterns. And again, we see a very distinct pattern of they are still doing it. So also in this campaign, um, the accounts from, from the IRA were tweeting the same content within a very short time window. Here the colors indicate the language of uh, the account. So red is in Russian, blue is English, um, yellow is Spanish. So here we see a, a roughly that it decomposes into, into the languages, but again, we see this pattern quite clearly. The same is for the activity through, throughout the day. Now again, German, here we have, are looking at German, English, and Russian. Most activity is uh, during what we would say are um, office hours. So we see, um, we were very surprised about it, that this behavior is very consistent with this old case, um, that this is still being done. Um, I've been mostly talking now about like how they they uh, coordinate themselves and how um, like, yeah um, their their activity patterns. But it's also interesting to look what are they actually tweeting about, so their actual content about it. Um, and there is a very distinct, um, a very big difference between the two campaigns. And the NIS they were mostly focused on um, trying to to make as much negative um, or do as much negative tweeting about North Korea as possible. And they were really just pushing uh, Park as a president. So there was no negative um, comments on, on the opponent. It was just pro-Park postings. The IRA, on the other hand, um, while they also do this, this, this pro-Trump during the election or anti-Ukraine in the beginning or in, the, in 2014, they also very much engage in more liberal topics. Yeah? So in, in they were very active in, in the, on the hashtag Black Lives Matter and in, in anti-gun um, uh, posting. And as a matter of fact, they were, if we would say, they were more successful in posing as liberals in the sense that their tweets get more retweets. They are featured in, on, on newspaper sites as an embedded tweet and so forth. Um, so here, it's not only looking at one side, but both sides with the aim. Uh, if we look at the retweet networks, uh, here, um, this was on, on Black Lives Matter. Uh, these are, the blue ones are normal accounts, the red ones are um, IRA accounts, is to, to work towards a very polarized society. So trying to push the two sides, you know, the more liberal or more conservative, conservative side, further apart to just uh, 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 increase the polarization of, of the um, society. So um, what I've been talking about was uh, the, the concept of political astroturfing, that we view this as a more centrally organized message coordination um, uh, yeah, form. And um, what is very important is that all this, this methodology or the, these machine learning algorithms are not enough to look at the, the human component of, of uh, these campaigns. Né? What machine learning algorithms do, they look at the metadata and that's it. They do not go beyond or they cannot or they do not look at these coordination patterns. Um, 
we used some of the bot detection algorithms on, on the data we have and they fail in, in a sense that they might uh, pick up 50% of the accounts but miss the other half and would detect um, we looked in the in the North Korea in the South Korean case. Uh, some bot detection algorithms gave us 14,000 additional accounts, which uh, was was unreasonably high. Um, and we think that it's it, these these traces that are left from the agents um, are something that they might not be able to eliminate completely in these in these um, in these campaigns because of these. Uh, these, the lack of intrinsic motivation of, of uh, the agents. Then, of course, one has to talk about the, the impact. Do they, does it even matter what they do? If you look at the online perspective, um, this is a comparison of number of followers from, from um, NIS accounts, regular users, and a set of um, identified opinion leaders in, in South Korea, so mostly journalists. Um, they have more, uh, on average, more followers than regular users, but the shape is very distinctive. So they have, almost all of them have exactly uh, a thousand followers. Um, and there were 1,008 accounts uh, that, that they had. So we do not have data on it, but it's very likely that they just followed each other. So, and that's it. The same holds for retweets. No? They get, on average, more retweets than the average user, but 80% of the retweets they get come from themselves. So they only get around 20% of retweets from, from, from your regular users. And the same is for mentions. So it's basically uh, they created their own echo chamber and just discuss with each other. Um, then, of course, um, big question is certainly, can, how do we measure the impact to, on, on the, the, the users of social media? So thus, being exposed, what apparently 200 million Americans were to these posts, does exposure directly mean that people get influenced by this? Um, most of the, there's not much research on it, but it's, it's um, very unlikely that all this, this hysteria has and is grounded in anything. So what we believe is that this, this whole campaigning is not really very, very um, effective. Um, but still, uh, it would be interesting to see what can we do against this, uh, these, these campaigns. So there is an, an interesting case in Germany, actually. Um, there is a um, um, right-wing movement called uh, Re Reconquista Germania. So it's a group of right-wing people who want to uh, get back um, the, 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 the country from um, all the, the immigrants, refugees, and so forth. And, and um, a comedian started a counter, uh, counter campaign uh, that was Reconquista uh, the Internet. So w which were targeting these, these, these campaign, but the problem is that this just resulted in Reconquista Germania getting more exposure and more people to follow them. So it would be interesting to, to see what are actual um, good counter strategies against it. But as I said, so far there's no ev real evidence that this has an, an, a big impact on society. So that's why I just keep calm and carry on tweeting. Thanks. Okay.